Welcome to another thought-provoking conversation about the challenges of spaceflight. This Thought Leaders Lecture Series is hosted by Space Center Houston and sponsored by UTMB Health. I am Dr. Yael Barr, the Artemis Cross Program Risk Lead for NASA's Human Health and Performance Directorate, and also a Clinical Assistant Professor of Aerospace Medicine within UTMB's School of Public and Population Health. I'm excited to join you tonight for an in-depth look into the Artemis One space mission and its role in enabling human exploration of deep space. The scheduled launch of Artemis One is the first in what NASA describes as a series of increasingly complex missions to build a long-term human presence at the moon for decades to come. Success with Artemis One will ensure safe spaceflight for the many missions yet to come as our nation pursues its goal of long-term travel to Mars and beyond. Our speakers tonight include Robert Hanley, Rosemary Sargent, and Jeffrey Fox. Mr. Hanley is a technical assistant for the Vehicle Integration Office in the Orion program, providing highly specialized engineering support for any problems that may arise during Artemis I, from launch to splashdown. Ms. Sargent is the Artemis II mission manager, responsible for planning and execution of the first Artemis mission to include a human crew. And Mr. Fox, is Chief Engineer of NASA's Rapid Prototyping Lab, where he and his team create quick and accurate solutions for challenges encountered during the development of space vehicles. UTMB Health is excited to continue to learn more about NASA's plans for further exploration of space. We appreciate the expertise that tonight's speakers and their colleagues bring to tackle the challenges ahead as they pave the way to success for Artemis. Let's settle in and learn more about this exciting mission to the moon and beyond. Thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm William Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston, a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination and nonprofit science center. We also have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future, with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Orion Spacecraft, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our Thought Leader Series brings you space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Space Center Houston offers robust learning experiences that enable you to be part of NASA's mission. In addition to our extensive collections, you can experience new exhibits and live programming, so there's always something new. Now on to our program. NASA's Orion spacecraft is built to take humans farther than they've ever gone before. Orion will serve as the exploration vehicle that will carry the crew to space, provide emergency abort capability, sustain the crew during space travel, and provide safe re-entry on the way back to Earth from deep space return velocities. Orion will launch atop NASA's rocket, the Space Launch System, or SLS. On the first integrated mission, Artemis 1, an uncrewed Orion, will venture thousands of miles beyond the moon over the course of about six weeks. The mission will pave the way for flights with astronauts beginning with Artemis II. In our discussion, we'll learn about the Orion spacecraft, the research aboard Orion, and how it's supporting our return to the moon and beyond. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists for our September Thought Leader Series, the Orion spacecraft presented by UTMB. Our first presenter is Robert Hanley, who is the technical assistant for the Vehicle Integration Office in the Orion program. Robert provides technical management support of the Orion Mission Evaluation Room called the MER for Artemis One. The MER provides highly specialized engineering support for any problems that may arise during the flight from launch to splashdown. Robert also supports flight crew systems integration and human rating certification for future missions, including Artemis Two. Artemis Two will have astronauts on board. Hanley has been at NASA's Johnson Space Center since 1987, working with the Space Shuttle, International Space Station, and Gateway programs. He earned a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Our second presenter is Rosemary Sargent, who is the Orion Artemis II Mission Manager for Lockheed Martin Space. In this role, she's responsible for all aspects of mission-specific planning, integration, and execution for the first crewed Artemis spacecraft. She serves as the primary Lockheed Martin customer interface to the NASA Mission Vehicle Manager and partners with the NASA Vehicle Manager to ensure mission success for the entire assembly, test, 
launch and integration phase through flight, crew module recovery, and post-flight analysis. Rosemary graduated with honors from the University of Scholars program at Pennsylvania State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering and received her Master's of Business Administration degree in Management and Organizational Behavior from Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Our third presenter is Jeff Fox, who is Chief Engineer in the Astronaut Office Rabbit Prototyping Lab at NASA Johnson Space Center. He is part of a long line of family who worked at NASA, including his father, mother, sister, brother-in-law, and nephew. He began his career at NASA in 1984 after graduating from Texas A&M University with a degree in industrial engineering. He led a flight demonstration with the FAA testing augmented reality concepts aboard the Challenger 604 flight inspection aircraft. He's also served as the Orion cockpit deputy for several years, leading initial development of several early mock-ups and testing. He began his present position with the rapid prototyping lab designing cockpit displays and control interfaces for the Orion, Gateway, and several human lander systems. Jeff championed the creation of a parachute debris monitoring tool used in flight aboard U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopters during Orion parachute testing at the U.S. Army Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. The tool is also used on board a U.S. Navy Seahawk helicopter over the Pacific Ocean during Orion exploration flight test, known as AF-1, from the spacecraft parachute deploy to splashdown recovery sequence. Preparations are underway to do the same for Artemis 1. Welcome to all of our panelists. I'm so excited to hear your comments today. And we're gonna begin with remarks by Robert. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Robert Hanley and I'm with the Orion program, which is part of the entire Artemis enterprise. So what is Artemis? The purpose of Artemis is to enable human exploration to the moon and then to Mars. With Artemis missions, NASA is going to land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And we have new technologies to explore more of the lunar surface than we ever have been able to do before. And all of this we're doing in collaboration with our commercial partners and our international partners. And we're going to establish the first long term presence on the moon. Then we will use what we learn on and around the moon to take that next diet leap that we would like to do, and that's sending the first astronauts to Mars. There's an awful lot on this chart, but you can see that Artemis is a really big enterprise. It consists of a lot of things, including our ground systems at the Kennedy Space Center and other locations, our space launch systems, the really big rocket, the Orion spacecraft, the Gateway, and many other spacecraft that are going to enable us to go to the moon to stay. First, let's go ahead and talk about Orion. When you see it on top of the big rocket, you see it all covered up with these protective panels, and the launch abort system on the very top. So you don't get to see a whole lot of Orion just yet. Within eight and a half minutes after launch, Orion's gonna be out in the sunshine. The SLS did its job and it's just Orion for the rest of the mission. So we named Orion because it's named after one of the brightest and most familiar and easy to spot uh, constellations in the sky. This is a brand new spacecraft and it can accommodate four crew members for up to three weeks and provide a safe habitat. And they'll be in this, the Orion spacecraft for launch They'll be there for the on-orbit operational period, splash down in the ocean after the mission's over, and then recovery when we bring the capsule back in and get the crew out. And it's also really nice that it's designed to fit 99% of the uh, human population, so there's, there's space for everyone. The Orion has two main parts to it. The first of all is the Orion, is the crew module, which is the, the shiny part in the front there. And that's where the crew's going to be during the during the flight this is the pressurized area and they'll work in there they'll live in there and as they're going to the moon and uh, and back the orion crew module is about 30 percent larger than the apollo capsule was it holds more crew members we have four versus the three it can handle longer missions and it's got crew accommodations like a galley to be able to prepare food um, it's got a toilet it's got exercise capability which is one of the things that was very difficult during the apollo flights was to be able to exercise inside the, the capsule. And we have found over human space flight history now that exercise is very, very important. Orion's got a lot of upgrades than we had when we went to the moon the first time. Um, it's got modern avionics, it's got advanced environmental control systems, and it's got lots of radiation protection, which will be just key when we do these long duration missions. The Orion's also going to be the transport for the lunar samples that the crew's going to collect to bring back to the Earth for analysis, as well as other payloads that we're going to have for deep space research. The crew module is connected to the service module there on the back end, and that's been provided by our partners in the European Space Agency and is the powerhouse for Orion. 
The service module provides some critical functions, including propulsion, thermal control, electrical power generated by the solar panels that you can see there. And of course, Orion has lots of other uh, cameras on board that will be getting some great views from space. In addition to its function as the main propulsion system for the Orion, it's responsible for orbital maneuvers that we're going to do and position control, which is very critical for a spacecraft for pointing as well as docking with other, other craft, spacecraft in the future. OK, let's talk about some payloads that we're going to have on the first mission for Artemis 1. In addition to testing out the Orion spacecraft on that first flight, we have a lot of experiments both inside and outside of the crew module. Inside, we have a series of experiments that are going to be dealing with radiation, biology, and we have a passenger, uh, his name is Commander Munikin Campos. Now, Munikin is going to fly inside the Orion on Artemis 1. He's going to collect data for the ground teams to, to look at, to evaluate the, and fine tune the crew conditions that we have during missions to the moon. He actually sits in the commander's seat, and he's going to be wearing the same launch and entry suit that the astronauts will wear on their crewed flights. Testing of the impacts of the, on the human body and radiation are super important for these longer deep space missions. We have two additional seats on Orion that are going to be occupied by mannequin torsos, and they are made from materials that will mimic human bones, soft tissues, and the organs of an adult female. The torsos have lots and lots of sensors, We've got 5,600 passive sensors and 34 active radiation sensors uh, on board to measure radiation exposure. Orion will carry several additional experiments and, and instruments on board to study the radiation environment um, that is present for missions to the moon and beyond the moon. Orion's also going to carry some a payload for biology. It has four space experiments inside for biological research. They're going to be looking at the effects of deep space environment on the nutritional value of seeds, DNA repair of fungi, adaption of yeast, and gene expression of algae during the mission to the moon. This is all to see how radiation is going to be impacting the human body. We have a really fun experiment called the Crew Interface Technology Payload, which I believe Rosemary is going to talk about a little bit later on in the program, and that is a very uh, interesting one for everyone to know about. And then we have 10 CubeSats that are shown here on the right side of the screen that are going long for the ride to the moon. Since we're on our way to the moon anyway, uh, it's a great opportunity to have lots of co-manifested payloads that can go along for the ride. We have 10 different ones of these, and when we after we launch it off the uh, Kennedy Space Center, shortly after the flight has begun, we're going to release these CubeSats into orbit, and they'll be traveling towards the moon as well. We will have already left and gone ahead of them, but they're going to be coming out. They've got their own solar panels, their own experiments, and they each are about the size of a shoebox. Uh, they weigh 25 pounds or less, and they'll be doing all kinds of interesting things, studying the moon, um, studying radiation in the atmosphere as the uh, CubeSats leave the Earth's atmosphere, um, environment around the moon. We even have a Japanese lander that will be the very smallest, the first smallest lander ever to land on the on the lunar surface. We have one that has a solar sail. Lots of cool experiments with these uh, CubeSats that are going out. OK, it's so a very busy chart, so we're going to kind of go with colors here a little bit. We will launch from the Kennedy Space Center um, there in Florida. We're going on the green line right now. We're going to go up and get into the Earth's orbit in that perigees raised maneuver, which is going to get us into low Earth orbit. We'll do some checkouts of our solar panels, some initial checkout of the spacecraft, and then we're going to get around about two hours in, a little bit less than two hours, maybe an hour and a half. We're going to do our translunar injection. We call that the TLI burn. That's the let's go to the moon burn. So from that, our upper stage will get us, we'll do about a 20 minute burn and we'll get us headed towards the moon. About two hours after launch, the upper stage is going to leave us and it's just going to be the Orion to continue on towards the moon. The upper stage is going to do its own little travel to the moon as well and eventually go around the moon and then go off on its dis disposal orbit. But when it's doing that, it's going to release those CubeSats that I talked about on the previous slide. That's it, their opportunity to get out and get going. We are then going to do our, dis our next burn to do a raised burn to get headed towards the moon and we'll continue along the green line we're going to swing around the moon. We're going to get very close to the moon, about 60 miles above the surface. And then we're going to get into what we call our distant retrograde orbit. And that's going to get us into an orbit around the moon that's going to be 40,000 miles above the lunar surface. We're going to be further away from the Earth in a human rated spacecraft than any other spacecraft has ever gone. So we'll be in this DRO uh, orbit for about 10 days or so 
uh, depends on when we are launching, and we'll go around and do finish checking out systems on the Orion spacecraft, study the radiation experiments, and then following our 10 or so days in that particular orbit, then we will get into the blue line, which we're gonna do our departure burn, in which we will then travel back close to the moon, about 60 miles above the surface, and then we're gonna follow that along, and it'll take several days to get back to the Earth. And once we get close to the Earth, we're gonna separate from the service module, and the capsule will be flying uh, by itself, the crew module, and then it's gonna turn around, re-enter the atmosphere, and get on the parachutes that come down to the ocean. This is a very critical test for the Orion 1 flight because the temperature that it's gonna see is incredibly hot, 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, over 2,700 degrees Celsius. That's about half as hot as the entire sun and twice as hot as our spacecraft that come back from the International Space Station. So we're coming in very quickly and we wanna be able to test out that, uh, that heat shield to make sure it's gonna work just fine. We'll then splash down in the ocean and then uh, the ship will come and recover the spacecraft and then future flights will be recovering the crew as well. And so that's the overview of the Artemis One mission. Robert, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation about the Orion craft and the program and also the incredible experiments that are on board that we'll talk more about during our Q&A. And I'd like to turn it over to Rosemary. Thanks, William. All right, so I appreciate Robert for that uh, overview of NASA's Artemis mission. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the workforce um, th that's building the Orion spacecraft and the international partnerships uh, that go into the Artemis mission and Orion specifically. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the uh, the test program that's gotten us here where we are today. Um, Artemis One, of course, is sort of the culmination of our uncrewed test program, and there's been, there's actually been many many launches uh, ahead of that uh, that you may or may not be aware of, and I'll talk about how we, that we've incrementally gotten to where we are today. Um, but first, I am going to talk about, uh, like I said, the workforce that that build the Orion spacecraft, um, and although we we do have quite a lot of international cooperation and international partners, it is a NASA program, and it does start here. Um, so Orion has suppliers from across the U.S. Um, you see um, every one of the 50 states in Puerto Rico um, it contributes to the Orion program, and that's everything from uh, supply chain, raw materials, computer programmers, uh, of course, engineers, designers, electrical technicians, mechanical technicians, logistics, property management. Um, it's over 18,000 jobs just in the U.S. alone. Um, contributing, of course, this that includes the Space Launch System, Orion, and uh, EGS, the Exploration Ground Systems. Um, but in addition to that, we also have many international partners. There, as um, Robert alluded to, uh, there are a couple of the passengers flying on the crew module, which are international partnerships. Some of those CubeSats, as he mentioned. Also, the MARE payload, the radiation experiment with the human torsos, the female torsos that have a radiation vest. That's been a collaboration with the um, the German Space Agency, the DLR, and the Israeli Space Agency are, are partnering in that. Um, and also, um, Orion, the, the the primary contractor for Orion, who I work for, we also um, get supplies for um, some of our main sensors um, from international partners, including the Star Tracker. Um, which is uh, critical to our guidance, navigation, and control sensing. And then also in future missions for Artemis 3, the same company in Germany called uh, Jena Optronic that makes the Star Tracker also makes some of the docking LIDAR for that. But probably the one you may, may be familiar with, and Robert talked about the service module, is what we call the European Service Module, or ESM. So the European Space Agency actually has partnered with NASA to supply the service module for the Orion ship. And that is the main propulsion and power and also for the crew consumables are on the service module. And it again, it, much like uh, the Orion in the US, uh, in Europe, it's a collaboration of, of many different countries as well. Over 20 countries contribute uh, to the European service module. And you can see in this map, um, Germany is the prime contractor, a company called Airbus Defense and Space, who all, you may be familiar with them from the aircraft that they make. 
They also subcontract to many other countries. Italy, Talos Alenia Space is a big um, supplier of the primary and, and secondary structures. And we have electronics boxes that come from all over. The solar array wings that you see here uh, come from the Netherlands. And you even see uh, the US listed as a supplier to the European service module. And in fact, we do supply, it says gas tank on here, the, some of the crew consumables, including the um, composite over at pressure vessels or tanks that hold the, uh, the, the gaseous um, oxygen and nitrogen uh, for crew um, breathing oxygen and also pressurizing the crew module um, come from the US and um, a number of harnesses as well. So you can see this a, it's a great partnership in many ways, the payloads, the CubeSats, um, the European service module suppliers, um, Orion is, is, is really probably the most uh, international space, space exploration uh, collaboration in history. And this is a great picture of um, what we affectionately refer to as the short stack. So what you have here is um, at the top of the picture, this is the Artemis 1 short stack, very top, you recognize the crew module. And then you see that white ring below it. That's what we call the crew module adapter. And that's what allows the crew module, which of course is built in the States, it to be mated with the service module, which is built in Europe. And so everything below that ring there, where you see in this picture, you see the solar arrays that are installed there. Um, that's a service module in the central part. And then it's actually the uh, spacecraft adapter, that white skirt below. Um, this is in the operations checkout building here in Kennedy Space Center. And this was getting ready. You can see in the background, the spacecraft adapter jettison fairing panels in the background. So this was right before we were getting ready to do final assembly and put that fairing or that protected cover over the spacecraft so that it could be integrated with the launch abort system and transported to the vehicle assembly building for integration on the SLS rocket, which Robert talked about earlier. And of course, before that, this was sort of a go back in time a little bit. These are our colleagues um, from Airbus in Germany, and this was right before they were getting ready to ship the first European service module from Bremen, Germany, which is in northern Germany, to the United States to get eventually to Kennedy Space Center to be integrated into that short stack that you saw. A lot of these folks, a big part of the international collaboration isn't just exchange of hardware. A lot of these folks um, also, they either uh, came with the ESM, our European service module, in the heavy lift container aircraft that it came with, or they followed shortly thereafter. So they could continue to do some of the hands-on work um, to complete that the assembly of the European service module and also to ensure that it was, was mated properly with the crew module adapter and the crew module and then take that through uh, the integrated test and the integrated spacecraft test. So they are, they are these um, international partners, particularly from that you see here, also follow it to the States and help us integrate it all the way through that test program. All right, here's a couple more great shots. So you see in the left, this is a very early buildup of the service module. And you, in the previous ones, it, it's got some coverings on it. You can't really see inside of it. Those are the radiators. So the radiators are the active thermal control that's used to reject some of the heat that the spacecraft generates, particularly from its electronics, to reject that to space, to keep the spacecraft itself cool. But when you take those radiators off, you can see in that left picture, there's some technicians. This is early days in the ESM integration in, in Germany. And you can see that primary structure, as I mentioned previously, that comes to us from uh, Torino, Italy, and some secondary structure inside. And they're, they're putting on the, some of the miles and miles, or I guess kilometers and kilometers of wiring harness that, uh, that go into it. And then you can see side by side, um, the, each of the, this is a great picture because the service module is being built up in parallel in Europe, while the crew module is be being built up here in the States. And so you see that these two activities are happening at the same time. And on the right hand side, you can see it's very that very top of the crew module pressure vessel. And you can see that side hatch um, There is a technician at work on that side hatch in there. And so you can see we have this parallel uh, international activity going on at the same time. And both of the um, the modules come together uh, here at Kennedy Space Center uh, to be integrated fully. 
Uh, this is a great one of here at the operations and checkout buildings. This is what the crew module looks like before it gets all its thermal protection on the outside. This is the primary structure of the crew module we call the pressure vessel. So that is assembled here and you can see it's it's being lifted by the crane inside of our what we call the industrial operations zone and getting ready to go under test. So both the buildup that you saw in the previous one where we were actually building and, and the Europeans are building their part of the vehicle and we were here building our part of the vehicle. And then also the modules, the crew module and service module, and of course the launch abort system as well, undergo separate test campaigns. And But then when they're built up together, there's also an integrated test campaign. So that this would uh, take place here at Kennedy Space Center. And this was probably part of uh, getting ready to do the buildup and some early test phase of the, uh, the crew module. This is a great one and another example of how parts of Orion come from all over the U.S. This is from uh, the, the heat shield that is uh, manufactured primarily in Colorado, right outside of Denver, Colorado. The heat shield is really interesting and, and one of the examples of how we've taken some technology from early days of uh, lunar space exploration, which is this the idea of ablative material on a heat shield to protect the crew during what Robert was describing as that extremely high velocity re-entry from lunar or even further out in, in deeper space. The further you get, uh, as he alluded to, the heat that you see is tremendous. It increases tremendously because the uh, the velocity that you're re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, you have to protect the crew from that. So um, we've, we've built on some early designs and also um, through planetary spacecraft, which also use a, a similar heat shield to, uh, to make this um, one of the, the, this really one of the key safety items for the crew module is this re-entry heat shield. Ah, and then you can see uh, flipped over and you can see um, some technicians doing some final inspection um, of these tile material. This is called Avcoat, and this is an ablative material. The whole idea of ablative material is that it it's going to take the heat away from the the, the crew capsule, that is tremendous heat of reentry. And one of the, the ways it does that is with the convective heating by uh, the material itself can phase change from the solid to a gas and the gas moves that heat away from the, the crew module. So this is a very key element of the vehicle and you can see here in its final assembly. I said I also was gonna talk about the, uh, the integrated test program. A lot of folks think that maybe Artemis 1 is the first launch, it's the beginning, but there've actually been many, many uh, milestones on the way to get to the Artemis 1 launch. And one of the most interesting things that I learned was that the first time that you use your spacecraft's propulsion system with fuel is in space. So um, that's the so you you do a, a, a test program to to test the valves, you test the tanks, you test the functionality of the of the propulsion system, but you can't test it with fuel um, until you're actually in space. So how do you get uh, around that and make sure that your design is really going to work properly? Well, you build what's called a qualification module, and you take it out into the desert and you fire you fire it with fuel. So you build a as flight like as possible of a model that you can on Earth. And this is what you're looking at here right now. And this is what was the Orion propulsion system qualification module. So this was a full buildup of the service module propulsion system as flight-like as possible. It has the pressurization system. Uh, it has the, um, the helium tanks to pressurize. Uh, it has um, all of the, the nine main engines. So eight auxiliary engines, one uh, main engine, which is a, a, an engine that we are reusing from the space shuttle days. It, it's an orbital maneuvering system engine um, and it has reaction control thrusters. So you build up all of the piping and all the tubing to duplicate your service module propulsion system and then you take it out in the de desert, in this case, White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico because it, it's designed to do these hot fire testings. And so uh, this was um, what we used to, to demonstrate using the Artemis mission profile that Robert showed some of the most stressing burns, firing those engines, putting real fuel in there, and demonstrating that the design was going to work. So this one is one I find really interesting. It was one of the earliest tests that we did. As I mentioned previously, Artemis 1 is not our first launch of all the Orion missions. 
we did have the, the propulsion qualification module or PQM testing at White Sands, and we also had uh, three prior test flights. Of course, they're all unmanned, and they were primarily to demonstrate the design of the safety systems because Orion is supposed to be designed to be one of the safest um, spacecraft and, def and the safest spacecraft for deep space exploration for our crew. So we needed to demonstrate the safety features. So we started on the right here, you see pad abort one. And so in addition to what you've heard a lot about the crew module and the service module, um, the third main component of the Orion spacecraft is the launch abort system, the rocket on top of the rocket um, affectionately known as the pointy thing or the pencil. Um, and you see that, um, and what that is used for is if there is a, an issue or an anomaly with the rocket uh, during the launch on the pad or during ascent or anytime during the mission profile, the launch abort system will rapidly take the crew module away from any danger and it will uh, get the crew to safety. So you can see the first one was to demonstrate uh, if there was an issue on the pad, um, and we did demonstrate that uh, it, it is, is really incredible if you get a chance to look at that and just how quickly um, that launch abort system gets that, that the crew module off of the pad in the event of an, of an emergency. And then over on the left, we had another test flight called Ascent Abort 2. So that same launch abort system is capable not only of getting the crew module off if there's an issue on the pad, but if there's an issue during the ascent phase with the SLS, it can get the crew module off, orient it heat shield down, and return the crew safely to Earth. So what we needed to do for that, we didn't have an SLS, so we actually used a little missile uh, to get us in an ascent trajectory and then demonstrated that abort scenario as well. And then finally in the middle, you see Exploration Flight Test 1 or EFT-1, in which uh, we launched a crew module with it did not have a full up service module. It wasn't a full up crew module, um, but it was it was a demonstration. You see this on a Delta IV heavy rocket uh, here from Kennedy Space Center, and that was to demonstrate some of the primary uh, safety systems of the crew module and at early days. And one of the big ones was was the demonstration of the return of the crew module um, after several hours um, into the Earth's atmosphere to demonstrate that heat shield capability. And and based on these tests. Um, design changes were made, improvements were made, and so that's why we run a test program like this. All right, and that has all led us to here um, and back sort of wrapping around to the beginning, and you can see this is where we finally, we had that, that, that service module that came from Europe. We had the crew module and the launch abort system integrated together, and here you can see it's fully integrated in with the, with the payload fairings, and it was brought to the vehicle assembly building and integrated, you can see on the far right where it's integrated for the first time on top of the SLS. And to where we are today and getting ready for the what I call the final test flight, the final uncrewed test flight of the Artemis one, um, which we're all working to get towards as soon as we can get some great weather and uh, get us out and do yet another really, really rigorous um, test flight in this these long class missions. There's, it's going to test all of the uh, the spacecraft systems and demonstrate them and really stress them out. So uh, the, we're planning on learning so much from this uh, from this mission. And then finally, I did want to mention because Robert touched on it earlier. Um, one of the um, really neat things that is flying, it is an uncrewed mission, um, but there are passengers, as you mentioned, the Munikin Campos um, and the, the radiation vests. Uh, we're also flying, it's an industry-led technology demonstration called the Callisto. And Callisto is a partnership between Lockheed Martin, Amazon, Alexa, and Cisco Systems. And it's intended to demonstrate how a, a machine interface, some commercially available technologies can be used to maybe help the crew do their jobs more efficiently in the future on the crewed missions. And one of the th neat things, and William uh, alluded to it earlier about how, you know, how can we help people participate in Orion and in the Artemis mission? Well, if you have an Alexa, um, you can say, Alexa, take me to the moon, and it's going to interact with this Callisto payload. So I hope you get a chance to do that. Thank you, Rosemary. That is so fascinating. I can't wait to speak more about Callisto. I think that's a great way for people to participate in this mission and keep on top of what's happening. It's remarkable that you could use your home technology in order to do that.
Our next speaker is Jeff. Thanks. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi, thanks, William, and thanks to, to Robert and Rosemary for a thorough review of all the systems on, systems on the spacecraft, because where all those come together is in, again up on the pointy end, of the, pointy end of the rocket in the in the capsule, and that's the cockpit. And there's a little image of our decal of our lab kind of symbolizing the crew there, kind of looking up at the displays and controls, and then kind of staying with the theme of the, of the teamwork. The role of the RPL is to prototype all the displays and controls that the crew will use to interface with all these systems that Robert and Rosemary have been talking about. So, you know, they've covered a, you know, a, a, a vast array of them, you know, everything from something that might be your electrical bus in your house to your thermostat or your plumbing on top of all the propulsion systems and engines and, and parachutes that bring the crew back safely. So somewhere the crew has to have insight into all that information, and this is where it comes together. If you look at the top of the display there, uh, each there's three displays, if you kind of look carefully, there's one over the commander on the left, that's called display unit or DU1, in the center is DU2, and that's kind of a shared display, and on the right is DU3, and that's the pilot seat. Uh, we have two other crew that you can't see, they're down uh, below them, they don't have access to the displays, but just like most spacecraft, they're on the comm, they can hear what's going on. So this is mainly an, uh, mainly the configuration when you're strapped in for launch or the re-entry and splashdown, where you don't wanna be moving around, you wanna be protected if there's something uh, that, that you need to be protected from, either a splashdown or an abort or something like that. Um, now, when you're floating around, of course, you can unstrap, you'll take these spacesuits off, you'll be in a shirt sleeve environment, and you can get around and any crew can go in there and look at the displays and, and check them out. So in keeping with uh, the teamwork theme that, that, that uh, folks have been emphasizing here, uh, again, we want to give the crew uh, insight and in, you know, input into, into the design of the display and controls early and often. They don't do it by themselves. In the, in the RPL or rapid prototyping lab, we may program up the displays quickly, quickly for people to look at, but it's a much broader team. You have systems, you know, experts, flight control, uh, of course the crew, you, the contractor, safety, uh, human engineering that looks at the human factors of how you lay out a display. So all, all those uh, come together to, to make up the, the, the ingredients that come up with the displays that the crew uses to monitor all of those systems, all the telemetry coming from those systems, and then where appropriate and when needed, the commands to those systems, because you might need to turn an engine on or off. You might need to disconnect the battery that's that's uh, shorting out or uh, having a heating or issue. So all that comes together in this cockpit. So let's just keep talking about this a little bit more. Again, I mentioned there was DU1 on the left, two in the center, three on the right. So if you're sitting there with a sheet of paper nearby, uh, eight and a half by 11, that's the screen real estate that you got inside of each of these three displays. And if you take a uh, take and fold it in half uh, on the short ways, you know, the uh, like portrait mode, fold it down, you've got two halves of a display that make up each of these uh, displays you're seeing up over the crew's head. So you have six half screens, if you will. And that's all you have to do all the nominal monitoring of the, the systems, interface with the systems with procedures, monitor malfunctions. And so you have to be creative about how you do that. So that's what we do in the RPO with the, the wider community. And we prototype those ideas in, in pound on them until they become something that everyone believes is the best that we can do given the time and, and money and, and, the, and the systems that we have that can support these designs. So if you look around, let's say the center display there, you can see some push buttons. There are, they call them bezel keys or edge keys for short. Down the lower right corner of that center display, you see a silver knob. It's got a funny name, it's called the twizzle knob. And actually what that thing does is you rotate it around with your finger and it helps you move around in the interior of the display to get to different uh, interfaces that allow you to command them. So it might turn a, a pump on and off or, or command something in software. Uh, that's how you get access to the inside the display. On the bottom there, on the top and uh, at the bottom of each display, there's a menu in that there's some little edge keys and you can kind of see some little symbols above that, maybe with some names. 
And that's how we select the different displays. Uh, what you can't fully see is the top half of the displays, and we have the same uh, a set of, of displays on the top there, so top and bottom on each display. And the menu for those is on the top of the display, so it's slayed to the top, and the bottom menu is slayed to the bottom display. So now you can, you know, if you're floating around in orbit, you can go up there, you can select what uh, display you want up, you can use your twizzle knob, you can move around, you can land on something. And above the twizzle knob, which may not be visible, is a little, little bezel key, it's called the inner key. When you push that, a little pop-up window comes up on the display and it asks you, what do you want to do? And it gives you the predetermined solutions, on, off, manual, inhibit, and you can select those. So that's generally what's going on when you're when you're on orbit and you're out of your seat floating around. But what happens when you're strapped in and you can't reach all of those little bezel, bezel buttons? Imagine you're looking, you're in the left seat and Robert mentioned earlier that we can uh, handle the whole anthropometric range from I believe it's 1% Japanese female to 99% American male. As you can imagine, that's a wide uh, a array of body sizes. And on the short side of things, if you're on the shorter side of that, you may not be able to reach that button. So what do you do? If you're strapped in for launch or for the entry, you might have to interface with that top display. So we have something that we prototyped in the lab called the cursor control device or CCD for short. And basically that's a control you can rest your hand on. It's in your left hand. It doesn't move, it stays fixed, but it has uh, a little, uh, what we call a rocker switch. It acts like that twizzle knob. It allows you to race around inside of the display so you can get access to the, any of the content on there and change it as needed. And there's an inner button on there and a couple other controls. So that's a, a good solution. You know, another thing is you may not be wanting to reach around like that when you're on a launch in the phase where you might do an abort. You know, probably don't want your arm extended like that. You know, you wanna get through that phase where you're no longer using the escape rocket. And as soon as that jettisons, okay, now, now I could reach up and do something. But, you know, the crews will know, you know, what they can do when. So what we're rolling in here is a couple of images. Each one of those represents one of those half displays. And again, we have six total. You're seeing two right here. And again, you can kind of see the, the edge keys on the top there. You can see a, a name uh, up there on the top in the upper left in green. And that represents, in this case, what we call a primary flight display. That doesn't really mean a lot to most people, but think of an ADI or an eight ball, like when you're flying an airplane, that's a digital representation of it. So the crew would obviously want to monitor that in, in a lot of flight phases, not just the, the ascent, but also the entry, there's times when you need a version of that when you're on orbit and you're doing a bunch of these burns, small burns that correct your trajectory on your way to the moon. So it takes about 60 plus displays of this type to get through all the flight phases and systems that Robert and Rosemary talked about already. That's a lot of displays, a lot of prototyping, a, a lot of evaluations with the astronauts and other engineers inside of our simulators. If you look over here on the right, you can see a representation of some engines. Uh, and again, Rosemary touched on that uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, in the center there, you see on the bottom, it looked like some main engine bells. And on the right are very small thrusters. But then again, you can go in there and interface with those and you, know, you can prevent them from firing. You can tie their fuel systems together. If one of their tanks had a problem, you can isolate the tank and feed fuel from another tank. Um, so you, you've got a lot you can do. Now, while we're on this, you know, some people probably look at this and go, how come I don't see more sophisticated graphics? I see all kinds of sci-fi movies. I, I see other spacecraft. They seem to have all this fancy graphics. Well, we can do that. The challenge is we have the, the radiation environment, especially when we get away from the Earth, is pretty harsh, uh, much harsher when you go on out in the, uh, on the way to the moon. So you have to radiation hardware all of this avionics to protect you for, so it won't shut down or won't get corrupted or as easily. So the radiation cards that we had were circa, you know, some number of years ago, we were locking down these designs and it were able to produce graphics and textual information of this sort. 
if we were going to try to build a, a graphics card or use one that could do all these fancy graphics, which we love, it cost an, inor an inordinate amount of money. So, you know, we chose to use what we had. It was a little more economical. We made it work within the within the, the, the what we had available to us and, and it works well and it, and it does the job. Um, something else that people may ask about, they look at these the interface I described a few minutes ago and they might say, why aren't you using a touch screen? Everybody's using a touch screen. Well, we looked at all that and, it, you know, and again, this was a num quite a few years ago is in the life of a spacecraft. It's a long design cycle and it's been been long, long wait for all of us, uh, in, you know, in the design world and, you know, engineers and in and, and the public waiting for this rocket, you know, to launch and get started with the Artemis missions. But when you make those kinds of decisions early on, you know, some of these other technologies may not be as mature. For example, a touch screen, you know, we looked at that and there were pros and cons with, you know, bumping into it or damaging it, or is it mature enough to use in space flight? We looked at things like, not, not to throw out brand names, but just something like a Sony gaming controller in your lap. And we said, well, we, could we use that? Well, we looked at a lot of comp, uh, cockpits, uh, military, civilian, and other areas, and how they were doing it. And suffice to say that everything boiled down to this just seemed that the right uh, set of controls to go with this set of software to operate the spacecraft. Um, now, one other thing I want to point out about the software is kind of the magic of the whole cockpit, and that's EPROC, which is Electronic Procedures, EPROC for short. And what that is, is you can work procedures manually and it can be very tedious because as you know you know in a spacecraft you can get procedures that up hundreds of lines and that's a lot of moving around that little twizzle knob or your cursor control device and pushing buttons when you get to the eproc in what we call the guided mode or the assist mode the software can actually go in and queue up the neck the steps for you it can it can identify the correct piece of telemetry on a system display that goes with that procedure so that the crew doesn't have to look at the procedure and a whole bunch of lines of information, look up at another monitor for where the system display is and maybe look at the wrong thing and pick up the wrong data and, and answer the question incorrectly. So uh, this system will make sure that you line up on the exact piece of telemetry you need. Uh, it'll also, when you press a button and acknowledge, yeah, that's good, It'll, it'll move on and index down and gray out and capture the, the uh, telemetry that happened at the time you answered the question. So it gives you a history. So it's a really powerful tool. Uh, we're in the, the, the last um, you know, uh, uh, months of getting this on board, the flight vehicle working hard with Lockheed to, to get this into flight code. Here's just some examples of the crew I mentioned is in our um, simulators a lot. This is one of our upright simulators called the um, uh, one of our orbit cockpits. And you can see there we just in this one uh, early one, we have just kind of a foam board representation of the switches. And I'll draw an analogy back to the space shuttle and the Apollo. You had hard switches and paper procedures. Well, just to take something more recent that most people are familiar with with shuttle, you had upwards of 2,000 physical controls, switches, circuit breakers, rotaries, all kinds of things. That's a lot of physical controls with wiring and the weight and the complexity with that. Also, on top of that, you had paper procedures up to 250 pounds. And you can imagine that's a lot of weight and a lot of volume. So with the advances in technology up to Orion, it allowed us to take take advantage of a glass cockpit and put all these switch throws or these commands under the glass so we can get rid of all that. And it's definitely economical to do it this way. And paper goes away and you put that all under the glass. So really what you have in the way of paper is maybe a, you know, one little flip book that tells you how to reboot the, the computers if all goes bad. Well, then you wonder, well, what happens if we have a catastrophe and the computers won't come back up? Well, around those displays are hard switches, just a handful, we still carry some, to do some of the critical things, either with electrical power or deploy the parachutes, which you know both the previous presenters talked about, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a, a few more minutes. Uh, so anyway, we've done hundreds of these evaluations in different flight phase with the crew. 
just another example, kind of a nice picture there. That, that's just a, a faux visual there out the window of Hawaii. Uh, you've got two crew there in the seat, and uh, you've got Lee there uh, directing the, or talking to the crew about an, an evaluation. They're probably working through one of the systems and you know, working through a checklist and giving us feedback, either it works well or we need to make changes. So again, doing hundreds of these helped us refine this to get it to the state it is today. Uh, now we're going to kind of transition out from the cockpit. So now we can control the systems. We're going to move to some parachute testing. Um, fortunate to be a part of, of a good part of this. Um, we did a lot of this testing of the Orion parachutes out in Yuma, Arizona, part of a, a really talented large team, NASA contractor team working with the Army. And in this case, the Air Force, you see a C-17 aircraft. And they could drop this mock-up of the of the capsule at different altitudes up to 35,000 feet. Sometimes that was needed because you wanted to accelerate the spacecraft quickly to higher dynamic pressures. Uh, obviously, if you can fall longer and, and th faster through the atmosphere for the time when you put the parachutes out, and what is that shock load on the parachutes? You know that's different. Obviously, if you drop it lower and you need to put your parachutes out more quickly because you're getting close to the ground. You also can test things like what if one shoot is out? So we can safely land on two shoots, two of three, but if you lose one shoot. So we were able to test all those dynamics by uh, dr uh, dropping this thing out of the back of a C-17. We had 18 engineering tests. I believe it was 18 uh, tests out there over the years to get through all these test matrices. And then we have seven where we were, you know, qualifying it for flight and saying, you know, we we're doing these, uh, all the tests of the envelope this thing is ready to fly and then we pack the chutes and that's the parachutes they're sitting inside orion on the pad right now now this is just a picture over in the ndl the neutral buoyancy lab might have seen this you know in the movies it's uh, 200 feet long 100 feet wide 40 feet deep holds over 6 million gallons of water it's a great test bed it's inside of a building so on the left there you see a mock-up of the orion capsule in the water you see some by some divers there in a small boat. We can do things like practice putting a harness around the bottom of the spacecraft for when we splash down and how you use that to secure the spacecraft and tow it in to the Navy ship that's standing by out at sea to, to bring it in there and securely uh, uh, fasten it in, in the ship. And you can do other things in that in a controlled environment in that pool. So it's, it's a very uh, a, a good asset here at JSC that we have to test a, a lot of different uh, things on the on the spacecraft. Some of the things we do before we actually recover the space flight in the real world, we practice it with the Navy out at sea. We actually did this uh, last year. Uh, we, there's been a number of them done over over the years. Um, and this recovery of the spacecraft, obviously, after it splashes down, is the main goal, and it's part of a, a team that you know that's that's their whole whole uh, mission is to make sure this thing gets securely back in, but they work with the Navy divers. And in this case, we were testing some things where it looks like crew getting out of the side hatch and what, you know, getting them in the, in the life raft, you know, going through those different concepts over time. Here's a picture of going into the EFT-1 mission that Rosemary talked about a few minutes ago. And here it is in the in the water, not long after splashdown, not a lot of boats around it. You can actually see the Navy ship out in the distance behind it. To the right there, of course, is a view of the capsule under the parachutes, you know, just prior to splashdown. So this is like what we'll do for the actual or Artemis 1 mission and all the follow-on missions. So this will be the time when this whole NASA Navy team can practice recovering the spacecraft in the in the way using the procedures that we've all drilled on in the in the in the proper timeline to get it secure in the ship. There's another component to the water recovery, and that's you know as the capsule's descending down through the atmosphere, uh, we want to get imagery of it, especially of the parachutes. So here, this is a Navy Seahawk helicopter, and you see the whole combined Navy NASA team there. And what we're doing is we're at about 10,000 feet with the doors open on the helicopter and we've got a lot of cameras, video and still photos pointing at the capsules that's coming back through the whole parachute sequence all the way down to splashdown and we're in pretty close and we're able to get high resolution imagery because the engineers want to go and study that and find out how well these systems perform and you've got to be in the right place at the right time 
you know, to get that imagery. There's also some other craft, aircraft that support some commercial aircraft as well as our NASA WB-57. Encourage you to go look that up. That's another fascinating aircraft, high-winged high aircraft that can fly at really high altitudes uh, to help us capture imagery. And this is a nice picture in the, in the evening with the capsule in the well deck of the LPD. It's short for Landing Platform Dock. Um, this, this was a USS Anchorage. Uh, we'll have a different ship when we re recover for Artemis 1 in future missions. Um, interesting, you know, if you look up LPDs on the web, you'll see that there's lots of pictures from the rear where the doors close. There's, a, there's one that's down the water and then another one up the top, so you can completely seal that back of the ship. But, you know, kind of the way it works is you open these doors and then you, you know, intentionally put some water in the ship to lower it down in there so you can pull the... Um, the spacecraft in there and then of course you'll close the back door if you will and seal it then you'll pump that water out and you'll have a, a safe and secure um, capsule for transport back to san diego just kind of a nice closing slide there at sunset um, on one of our practice missions out there at sea off the coast of san diego and uh, you know with that that's a summary of the the, the cockpit and the rpl and the things we do and uh, in the recovery uh, at the very end of the mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was absolutely fascinating. And really thank you to all three of you, uh, Robert, Rosemary, and Jeff. It was so interesting. I learned so much about the Orion spacecraft and everything that goes into it. So my first question actually is, um, Robert, in the beginning you were talking about the extreme temperatures, and I'm aware that on the moon um, we had temperatures ranging from in the sun over 200 degrees Fahrenheit to below 200 degrees, negative 200 degrees. And I know on the cold side of the moon, it can get down to negative 400 degrees, right? So how is the capsule designed to keep the astronauts comfortable and safe when you have those kind of extreme temperatures? Yeah, that's a great question. And we deal with that anytime that, uh, that we're in space, even if it's low Earth orbit. When you're in the sun, direct sunlight, you're very hot. And when you're in the shadows, like if you're behind the earth and you're in the shadows, it's very, very cold. And so what we have is we have excellent environmental control systems aboard the spacecraft. And, and even a, a spacesuit for a spacewalk is the same kind of a, a thing where you have to take that really hot temperature and you have to keep it away from the, 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 the skin of the crew members inside. So we're gonna keep all the equipment safe at the right temperature with inside. And so we have environmental controls. We've got radiators on the uh, the spacecraft for Orion. So it will actually be able to take heat from the inside of the cabin. It's generated by the same things that you would have in your your uh, your home computers, um, uh, TV screens, all those sorts of things. And we can radiate that out from the inside. And on the outside, the the, the spacecraft is insulated properly to be able to withstand the temperatures on the outside. And we can circulate air. We can circulate fluids. Um, and use the radiators on the spacecraft to expel that heat back out into space and keep the temperature inside the spacecraft at just the right temperature. And then likewise, if the temperatures get really, really cold, we need to put heat into uh, the equipment to keep it in the, the right operating range, just like you would have at your house. You don't want to be too cold in your house. So if it's, if it's too cold in your house, you're going to add heat. If it's too hot in your house, you're going to take the heat away. And the spacecraft works the same way, even in these extreme temperatures. That's a great question. That's fascinating. Well, um, Rosemary, I wanted to ask you about um, Callisto again. I'm absolutely fascinated by this, and I think it's a fantastic piece of technology for people around the world to be able to query and interact with uh, the Orion craft. Um, are there any limits to questions that people can ask? Will, they, will you be able to query about the experiments taking place on board and get some preliminary data readings? I, I think there's only one way to find out, and that's to <laughs> that's to go ahead and and ask. Um, I, the only the only prompt that uh, that 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 is kind of what we know is going to generate a response is Alexa takes me to the moon. But there's uh, there's absolutely um, no limit to what uh, what folks should be able to ask Alexa about the mission about where 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 is Orion in the mission profile right now what's going on um in in uh in the Artemis 1 mission um so uh, there's going to be opportunities during the mission uh where we focus on Alexa and, and demonstrating uh the, some of the Callisto uh payload uh 
opportunities for the public and then also some where we're going to be demonstrating the Calisto, um the technology demonstration uh, for how it might uh, benefit the, the crew for future missions. Fascinating. We well, you know um, I wanted to ask Jeff about like, some of the human factors. I mean, I know there's a whole area of study that a lot of people don't know about human factors engineering, and it was really interesting to hear you speak about the interior design of the of the cap of the council and the, how you made decisions around durability and use and readability. So, do you have volunteers? I mean, you have astronauts that help, but what is kind of the process like to get to ultimately what works best in terms of the human factors use of the capsule for a variety of astronauts? Well, I think, well, it's a great question, William. Uh, you know, of course, our main focus is down there in the displays and controls, uh, and that's kind of the heartbeat uh, of, the, of the spacecraft, if you will, once the crew's in there during the mission. But there's a lot of things that surround the, getting to that point, you know, from the seat to exercise equipment that was mentioned to underneath the floor where all the storage lockers are and the windows and the hatches and uh, the human engineering or human factors folks come over with a set of you know requirements and standards that you know we need to to make sure we uh, um, adhere to but I, I want to give you a, a, a funny story uh, because we were sitting around probably about 10 or 12 years ago and I don't know if folks have seen the movie The Right Stuff and, and they're all up there and they're talking about we need a window in this cockpit and the engineers say no, no. And the crew says we're going to put a window in here. And I distinctly remember sitting in a room with the crew and we're going to have a window in here because we were talking about can we eliminate these windows? Not all of them, but you know, it became what well, in the end, if you look at Apollo and you look at Orion, it, they're pretty darn similar, sim similar, you, you know, that the things that you needed to do human factors wise from being able to see out the docking hatch on top, you know, so you got to think about what your mission is, what you got to do. You don't want to open a hatch blindly into the new gateway spacecraft or into a lunar lander. I got to want to see what's on the other side. So there's requirements and things that go into that or the front windows. There's four of them. There's two right over the crew's head you saw in the image. There's two more on the side like Apollo. Well, the crew, you know, if they lean back, there's a requirement to be able to see the horizon outside, you know, and know which end is which end is up. Is that water? Is that sky? Is that ground? Is that space? What? Where am I in my mission if I'm strapped in and I can't just float to the window? So, you know, all those decisions are part of like I always like to say a 50 variable plus problem. You know, none of them may be perfect but you're trying to get them all inside of, of like that game that has all the little metal pins in it. You push your fingers in. Can you keep them in this little sphere where they're op they're reasonably operable, but maybe none of them are perfect? Uh, so it's a lot of trade-offs. Um, in the early days of the Orion mock-up and that first image you saw of the crew laying down looking at dis the displays, that was over in our space vehicle mock-up facility, Building 9 here at JSC. And yeah, a lot of, uh, of these evaluations run by human factors that just wanted to get the crew climbing in. And how do you strap in? And, and, and is your head placement in the seat? And experts on the seat were over there. And uh, where do you stow everything? And, and I take my boots and my suit and my helmet. Where does it go? You know, uh, what happens? You know, when you get in the spacecraft right under the hatch, there's two things under the hatch, the potty and the exercise equipment. So the potty is actually under the floor level, so you would take a closeout panel off and it's down, you know, below. So, you know, don't think of sitting up like you are right now. You're, you're really kind of sit, well, you're sitting on your side down there. And then over that is uh, some equipment where you exercise. Well, well, that's a heck of a design, right? I don't want to put the next guy's exercising right over where I'm trying to go use the restroom. So, you know, there's some different closeouts we can put in there. And of course, you all know each other intimately well. You train all the time. You know, the you, you kind of get over that, but you know, you kind of shield that. So there's a lot of sausage making. The requirements are part of it, the practicality, um, and they all have to fit this one equation and in, in, in resultant is the inside of the cockpit. Uh, that is just fascinating. It's so complex and really interesting to hear about. I wanted to circle back, Robert, during your presentation. So, so interesting to hear about the other experiments that are taking place um, as part of the this Orion Artemis One mission. And 
there are a number of, and I didn't realize, a number of small satellites and other experiments that are going to be deployed. So could you tell us a little bit more about uh, those satellites and, and some of the experiments? Um, I was sure, particularly sure. interested in the one that's going to go down to the lunar surface. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, it's kind of fascinating. You have these things that are the size of a shoebox. They're really, really small. And we have 10 of them on Artemis 1. And in that separation ring between the upper stage and the, the service module that Rosemary was talking about, we have all these nice little sleds that are around there. And during the course of the uh, the transit of our upper stage after Orion has left, we're going to be able to shoot these things out on springs. They'll get out there and be able to start their uh, their missions. And so there's quite a few of them, well, there's 10. Um, there's one that's going to be working, looking for water in all kinds of forms, um, different volatiles that are on the on the moon. So we do have water that's actually frozen on the moon. Believe it or not, there's a, a good bit of water that's got things in it that we would love to be able to analyze what's in there. Um, high fidelity mapping of the, of the surface, we're looking for hydrogen. Uh, we have a lot of high fidelity maps of the Earth with different satellites, but we don't have as much of the moon. And so we have experiments doing that. Um, the Japanese experiment is called Amatanashi, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, but it will be the smallest lunar lander um, that we've ever had. So you're talking about a shoebox size um, experiment that's going to have a lander inside that will actually deploy and go out onto the lunar surface to study the, the lunar environment. We have one that is going to be looking at the magnetic fields um, as we travel it away from the Earth, kind of like a little space station on an asteroid, if you will, so a little small um, space weather station that will be going out there to help study radiation. One of my favorite ones is called uh, NEA Scout, NEA Scout. It's from, from the Marshall Space Flight Center. In fact, got a solar sail on it. And so it'll actually be its own little propulsion using a solar sail, using solar particles. And it'll be looking uh, at the magnetic magnetic field science. So that one's very, very cool. Um, we have another Japanese experiment that's going to be looking at the radiation between the Earth and the Earth-Moon Lagrange point. We have these little spots around the Earth-Moon system that are called uh, Lagrange points, and they're very stable orbits between the balances of gravity, Sun, Moon, Earth. And uh, so looking at the radiation, because we're actually going to be putting the gateway and then future Orion missions will actually be in an orbit that will actually go around the moon and around one of these Lagrange points. So it's very helpful um, for us to understand the radiation environment uh, since we will actually have people um, out there in that orbit. Um, we've got a really uh, a fun one that's for biology. It's actually got yeast, yeast inside that's going to be activated. And so we'll see how that yeast is reacting to the deep space radiation environment. Radiation, as you can tell, we've mentioned radiation a lot uh, during this talk. When you get out of the protective uh, bubble of the Earth, it protects us from a lot of bad radiation. Uh, we're going to be out in that, and especially traveling to Mars, we're going to have humans out there like for a long time outside that um, blanket protection from the Earth, and then, then Mars doesn't have Earth's protection either. So kind of knowing how that radiation is going to be affecting um, organisms and biology uh, will help us a lot um, to understand that. Um, there's one really neat one's called Team Miles. So this was a, uh, a competition from NASA's Deep Space Derby, and it's actually going to be using propulsion with a plasma thruster. Just talking small shoebox size, and it's got plasma thrusters on it. Um, and so that'll be neat. And each one, they've all got their own solar panels. They're all, they're all very self-sufficient, and they'll be doing their own science for as long as the, they'll be able to last out there in that deep space environment. That's fascinating. Well, I imagine the plasma thrusters will keep that going for a very long time. That's pretty, pretty remarkable. Thank you. Well, you know, Rosemary, I wanted to ask about international collaboration because, I mean, it's something that's kind of a hallmark of NASA. You know, ISS, of course, is a collaboration among um, five space agencies and and it's worked very well over the past 22 years or so. Um, but this is, you have even more participating, more countries that are part of the Orion program. Um, and of course, we all know we have a hard enough time communicating with each other in English. And you, you know, you have different languages, you have different measuring standards, right? Is it metric or are we using pounds or kilos? So how does that all happen? Is there somebody in charge of ensuring that communications are accurate? Um, ensuring that all of these uh, vehicles will will actually work the way they're supposed to work with each other? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and 
so it, it's been really interesting because um, the uh, the European service module um, was actually a sort of a, a heritage development. So um, you know the crew module is a brand new development. So um, but the the um, European service module was actually developed off of an uncrewed um, a cargo transporter uh, that used to uh, support the International Space Station. So it would, would was un, uncrewed uh, transporter that would bring uh, like a, a truckload of you know supplies to the the space station. Um, and so that was the basis for the design for the European Service Module. Um, and you know of course the ESA, the European Space Agency, and NASA, we, they looked at that and they said, well, you know, we're working on a crew module design and you guys have kind of an existing design that could be modified. But it's interesting, clearly that was what was a 100% European design, so that was going to be metric, right? It was going to have some parts from uh, its heritage design, and then it was coming with this this brand new development uh, the coming from the, the, the US side. And so, uh, the collaboration and communication has to be precise, right? Um, we've seen errors in the past with conversion and so forth. So um, the the biggest thing that you have to have um, in that collaboration, there's is essentially an interface interface control. So um, we we have we set up an interface control document uh, between the service module and the crew module, for example. And so every single interface, the propulsion, um, you know, the we, we talked about uh, the the radiators. So the radiators um, on the service module are rejecting heat from the crew module. So that interface, every nut, bolt, screw, mechanical interface has to be part of this interface control document. And so everything is really negotiated really precisely. Um, uh, overall, kind of the the, the general um, and and that 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 document and that those agreements um, are are owned by you know both sides of that interface. And so anytime there's a change on either one, they have to have you have to have agreement um, across across the board. Um, and that's it's definitely not easy, um, but it's one of the keys and one of the things that drives us drives our collaboration. Um, and there's so many. Um, the countries you saw cooperating uh, on just on the European service module part of things. And so they're all speaking different languages. So um, what what uh, ultimately we all agreed that English would be our collaborative language. Um, so uh, and that's that makes that easy, certainly for us. Um, but just uh, having that that daily interaction that that down to every single point of the vehicle that that touches and having that that agreement on both sides uh, is absolutely key to that success. Fantastic. I mean, it, I always have said that um, I'm an unapologetically kumbaya. I really think that space exploration brings people together from all walks of life in all parts of the world and enables absolutely. us to look at something, you know, the kind of a higher purpose. Yep. And I think this is a great example of it. You know, all the collaboration that's brought this program to this incredibly critical point. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. This has been such a fascinating conversation, and I always like to wrap up by asking, how did you get into what you're doing today? Maybe we'll start with you, Jeff. Like, how is it that you came uh, to work at NASA and uh, into your current role? Well, how did I come to work at NASA? Well, gee, back as far back, I don't want to date myself, but mid-60s, my dad was in the Navy, uh, and he wound up being the, a lead of a human test subject group here, and he rode the centrifuge right over in Building 29, which is on site. Most people won't even know what that was because it's been repurposed many times. Um, I actually got to see it go around, <laughs> but uh, that was long ago. Uh, I, interestingly enough, he uh, actually holds the G record. Apollo suited at 16 Gs out here, but uh, anyway, uh, not a lot of not a lot of people were lining up to ride at those kind of uh, loads, but um, anyway, um, so I'd always been around it and uh, we moved Navy brat all over and then when we got to Texas my mother started working here and then my sister and then my brother-in-law and years later my nephew and you know and then I was rebellious I thought everybody works there I don't want to work there I want to do something else you know typical and I wasn't planning on coming out here and then you know was, you're you're you know if there's college age students out there and you're sitting worried about waiting to get that job and you're in the 
maybe you're in the spring or fall semester graduating, and you're like, man, what am I going to do? And so we kind of got in touch with NASA, and they were doing a hiring on um, for the shuttle, really spooling up to, to hire lots of, of people. And they gave me an offer and said, how would you like to train astronauts in the shuttle simulators? And I thought, well, that sounds horrible. Of course, you know, where do I sign up? How fast do I sign up? You know, I mean, but, but um, thank goodness, you know, I made that decision and, and I don't know what I would have done otherwise. I'd probably been perfectly happy, but I'm really excited that I did this. Um, and I'm going to say for the, I hate to admit this, but I'm going to say for students that are out there, if if you're struggling in math or any of those type of STEM, STEM you know, world areas that you need to get into, at least the engineering part. And again, I say NASA is very broad. There's a lot of jobs you can do out here. There's not just engineers. There's about every occupation you can think of. So if you set your sights to get out here, you can get out here. But, you know, persevere even if you're bad you know ju just get, get through it and know it's temporary and and I, just get that piece of paper and get out and and you can you can do all kinds of things even if it's not for nasa there are so many great things you can do in the stem uh world i always encourage that but uh but um, just go for what you enjoy and um and uh hopefully that answered it what a fascinating background. I Thank think you. also, I, you know, I totally agree with you that follow your passions and there are so many opportunities and there are all kinds of roles that support space exploration. You may not be an engineer or scientist, but you may be in fashion design or on spacesuits, or you could be someone in finance. There are all kinds of skills that are required. You know, it, it really is a village. So next, uh, Rosemary, I'd like to hear about how how is it you came to be where you are right now? Well, so uh, I was a kid and I went to see this little movie called Star Wars and um, uh, I decided right then and there, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, which was Luke Skywalker. Um, so it uh, it that gradually more uh, matured over time, uh, but I, I definitely became uh, as a result, direct result became obsessed with all things space. Uh, it was really my passion. I think Jeff said it, and you said it. I mean, if you if you do what you love, you you never work a day in your life, right? Um, and it's it evolved over time. Um, I uh, decided, well, what do I need to do to work in the real? You know, I wasn't born a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So what I need to do to engage in the real space program? And I did research, and I what I said was, well. At the time, when I was looking at going to, you know, into a field, um, there were electrical engineers were things that was was something that was needed. So what do I need to do and which schools did those electrical engineers come from and what other things uh, uh, did they pursue? And so I did all those things and um, really uh, gradually over time kind of evolved into um, uh, I was um, much better suited uh, to, to helping support. Um, with design and engineering and, and and management and international management than 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 um, you know some other things like uh, like Jeff was talking about as well and you, and you were alluding to uh, so that evolved over time into uh, into where I am today over a lot of years but uh, it's been just a, a really great journey. Wonderful. Hey, I'm also a Trekkie. I loved Star Trek and I love Star Wars, so I can relate to that very much. And lastly, Robert, please tell us about how you got to where you are today. Yeah, for me, very similar to, to Jeff and Rosemary, I really enjoyed space. And for me, when I was a little kid, as far back as I can remember, I was just fascinated by it. And this was before the Star Wars and the Star Trek had come out. Um, but when all my other friends were doing westerns and sports and all that kind of stuff i would pick up a stick in the front yard and it would become a spaceship instantly i didn't care what it was it was going to be a spaceship and so just growing up and, and going through the rest of high school and all that stuff and um people would ask me what do i want to do it's like well i want to work with space i want to go to nasa i just um i had a conversation with a friend recently who asked me when i was in a teenager did i know what i wanted to do and i said well yes i wanted to work i wanted to work at nasa um, maybe kind of weird, but that's just kind of what I wanted to do. And and when I got into college and picking degrees that I wanted to do, it's like, well, space. Well, that would be aerospace engineering, so I'll go with aerospace engineering. And I had this goal that I wanted to help design a space station and work with astronauts and work with spaceships. 
Um, and then in the end, when I did get to NASA and I got that phone call, would you like to come? I'm like, dream come true. And in my career, that's exactly what I got to do. I got to work with spaceships. I got to work with the space shuttle a great deal. Um, I got to help be part of the space station assembly, um, which was just amazing to me. Even now, every time I watch the space station fly over my house, which which anybody can do to see when it's going to fly over your neighborhood, I look up there going like, I helped with that. I helped put that together. Um, I was one of the, the ground team and the engineering staff that helped to do that. Um, and then you get to work with the astronaut. I worked for the astronaut office for a long time. And then when I got an opportunity, she said, I heard you were interested in coming to Orion. Let's talk. And so I did. And now here I am getting to work uh, with a spacecraft that's going to be going to the moon and take astronauts to the moon. And this is all happening in my lifetime. I do vaguely remember um, landing on the moon when I was a very small child. Um, and my, my, my parents, who clearly were into space as well, putting us in front of the TV set and watching this thing happen. And I had no clue what I was even watching it, but I can still remember it. And I think that was just uh, a sign of, uh, of where my life was going to go, um, that I was going to be involved in the space program. And I've had just a tremendous career and I just have done great things. I, I just have just loved it. And I would just encourage, like Jeff was saying, just encourage anybody, no matter what you are into, whatever your passion is, there's a spot for you at NASA somewhere. Um, we're not the biggest federal agency out there in the biggest space, but uh, but we have an awful lot to offer and it's a lot of fun. Well, listen, thank you all three for sharing your personal stories. I could see you each lighting up, talking about your early years and how you got excited and started your, in your path in life. And I'm, we're so fortunate that you did follow your passions because what a remarkable uh, conversation today about Orion and everything associated with it. Uh, truly, this is taking exploration for humans to a whole new level with the number of experiments that are taking place, uh, this new technology, and this is really a giant leap forward in exploration. So thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, episode of our Thought Leader series. Um, if you'd like to watch your episodes, other episodes, please go to Space Center Houston's website, spacecenterhouston.org, where this will be archived along with other programs that we have recorded. And we're very excited to watch uh, future missions of Artemis as we prepare for humans to create a long-term presence on the moon.